The hypothesis of my book and what I've come to learn, especially from dealing with the dying, is we wait too long to think about meaning and purpose and go for the lower hanging fruit of figuring out our finances first. Hey, Journeyers. I'm really excited for you to be tuning into this conversation. I have a special guest back on the podcast. His name is Jordan Grummet. He pursued financial independence to create a life of meaning and purpose by practicing hospice medicine and hosting the award-winning podcast, The Earn and Invest Podcast. His new book, Taking Stock, A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life should be out by the time you're listening to this. It's going to be available August 2nd. And so I'm really excited to welcome Jordan back on the podcast, talk more about his book, what he's been up to since the last time we chatted. So welcome back, Jordan. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to speak to the journeyers out there. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing I always like about you, Jordan, and then even our initial conversation, which I will link in the show notes because I forgot the episode title, <laughs> but I will link it in the show notes so people can check that one out after they listen to this, is that... I feel like you definitely approach financial independence in a, a holistic way, um, not just from numbers. Like, And it's because of your background and what you've seen in your years as a hospice doctor that allows you to even like have this perspective that I think is so just – it's not just like – it's it's just real because you've like seen the other side of things like what happens at the end of our lives and you know so I'm really excited for us to have this conversation about why money is not the end goal or why all our goals our money goals at least are not what's really that important even though it feels like it <laughs> especially when we are first starting out or if you're just finding out about like financial independence right you just want to get to the goal of like this these things but it's deeper than that right it definitely is and you know, I'm as excited as everyone else is about going into the details and talking about 401ks and Roth IRAs and different investment strategies. But I realized when I came to this field that there were so many people who were just doing it really well. Jamila, you're one of those people. You do it incredibly well. And I just knew that that wasn't the place for me to add to the conversation. Um, so I love those conversations too, but I do like to take a little bit more of that holistic approach why do what why do we do what we do with money and that really interests me yeah and that's the thing too like i found actually and i don't know if it's because i've been now doing this for such a long time it doesn't it's not that long compared to probably you know other people's careers in this industry but it just feels like i am at the point where i actually am not that excited to talk about like the mechanics right like what a 401k is. And it's not that I don't, like, I think it's important. So I do, you know, make sure that I am re, re, re introducing, reintroducing, explaining these ideas, because I do think there is a point where you need to be specific. Like you are talking about this idea of living the life we want, reaching financial independence, and it sounds great. And it is great. But then like in a day to day, what are people doing? But it's not just about like, which account you should open up and where you should invest. While those are important, there's a deeper underlying foundation we should hit first. So I'd want to go into that with you because you said something before the interview we pressed record about money or the goals, not financial independence, not being the goal. Right. And so let's, let's just dive deep in and say why that it shouldn't just be the goal. Well, first and foremost, it's really easy to make it the goal, right? I always talk about money goals as low hanging fruit. And the reason why is when you look at your finances, you can say, I would like to be at this place. And if you study financial independence, you find a number which sounds like or feels like enough. There are all sorts of formulas. We don't have to go into them right now. So you can set that up as a goal. And then the choices become somewhat simple, not necessarily easy, but simple. I can either work more or I can save more or I can invest and have a higher return. Maybe I can side hustle. Maybe I can change jobs. This is really satisfying because there are simple solutions to a problem which then becomes attainable. The problem with that is money in itself doesn't really do much for us. And I think we often forget that it is a tool in order to better allocate our time, right? So Time is a constant. We can't change it. We can't make more. We can't buy more. Time passes no matter what we do. The only thing we really have control of are, are there really two things. One is what activities fill that time and then how we perceive that time. Perception is a little bit more complicated, but when we're just talking about the activities we put into those time slots, 
we sometimes forget that the whole purpose of money is just to give us more control over what goes in those time slots. So if you set up your financial needs as your overall goal, hopefully you'll be lucky enough to get there, but then you're kind of stuck because now you've reached what you thought was your goal and you realize that besides having enough money to do what you want to do, there's nothing particularly self-affirming about a certain net worth number. So then you have to do the hard work of saying, okay, now I have money to control what I do during my time. And the big question then becomes, well, what the heck do I want to do with my time? It was something I didn't spend enough energy thinking about so that when I got to financial independence, instead of feeling really excited, I actually was a little bit stressed and anxious. It really made me look in the mirror and question everything that I had held up to that point because I had spent so much mental energy thinking about getting to a financial standpoint that I never questioned, well, what do meaning and purpose look like in my life? What does identity mean? And, and so for me, it was very tied up in being a doctor. I'm a physician. My father was a physician. He died when I was seven years old. I wanted to be just like him. I got to this point where medicine wasn't making me happy anymore and started concentrating on money. And then I got to the point where I had enough money and had to do the hard work of saying, okay, you can actually step away from this physician persona, which you've identified yourself for most of your life with. But then who are you? And that was really, really difficult. And um, strangely enough, some of those answers actually started coming from the fact that the one part of work that I still like doing, which was working with patients who were dying or in hospice, I started looking at their experiences. What happens when someone's told you have six months or less to live? And as I was living through them, living through this with them and their families, I was starting to learn some of those secrets about meaning and purpose and starting to try to apply them to my financial beliefs. Like I had all these interesting financial beliefs and then I saw what was important to people who are dying and I'm like, oh, the people who are dying, maybe they have something to really teach us younger, healthier people about what we concentrate on and specifically what role money plays in our life. Because, you know, I say this over and over again, in all my time in hospice, very rarely do I get a patient who's told they're going to die. They never say, I wish I worked more nights and weekends. They never say, I wish I made it to that net worth of 1.5 million, but I only made it to 750,000. That, that's not what's on their mind there are much deeper worries and concerns they have about meaning and purpose and regrets about not having the courage to do those things that was were important to them. And I started thinking, why aren't we thinking about this at the beginning of our financial journey and still waiting to the end? And I certainly, I'm guilty. I waited toward the late part of my financial journey into my 40s when I was very strongly financially independent to start asking these really important questions and I started thinking what, how powerful it would be if we could start doing this way earlier. I'm on board uh, with that. And it's one of the things I talk a lot, you know, hence journey to launch. Like for me, it's more about what we are, the life we are creating while we're on this path, because we've all been there where you know, we have a goal, whether it's financial, even like financial meaning, we, it's something we want to buy and we have the thing. And we get the thing and it's exciting at first, but then you're like, wait, something still, you still feel like something is potentially missing without fixing whatever that internal um, issue was, if there's an issue. So I just feel like you, I am on board <laughs> with what you are saying. I think what happens for people is, you know, there is a level of security that everyone needs, right? Financially. So it's like, you have to meet those needs first. And like, so there are some people who that's what they're focused on. They're focused on paying the rent and making sure they have this much income so they can pay for like a living in this world. Right. And then, but after a point, I know I have a lot of listeners and journeyers who they are at a space where they are comfortable enough where there can be some more flexibility in how they're looking at their money. It's not just survival anymore. And I find that there's a lot of content that talks to like survival. Uh, and, but there's, there's a, there's a spot where, now there's potentially more money. There's more than what you're spending on expenses. And the idea now is, do you invest and save and, you know, really double down on your money? Or what about the experiences and sacrificing maybe the work for more time? So how for you, like what, knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently on your path? That That is a great question. Before I get to that, I, I want to just address one thing. You know, when you're talking about 
basic needs, really we're talking about Maslow's Pyramid, right? So if you know Maslow's Pyramid, it is a pyramid that steps up and it starts at basic safety, security, clean air, food, living in a safe environment. That's kind of at the bottom. And then as you work your way up, you work towards love and self-actualization and some of those what we call higher needs, my theory is that we actually need to flatten Maslow's pyramid a little more and actually start thinking about all of our needs simultaneously instead of concentrating on the lower levels first. The reason why I say this is being in the hospice field, I've taken care of a lot of people in the last six months of life. And I'll give you two examples that I use in the book. I had a patient whose wife had dementia, he had to put her in a nursing home, he had made by bad financial decisions, he actually had to get what's called a Medicare divorce in order to pay for his wife's nursing home, although he loved her dearly, they had to get divorced so that Medicaid would pay for her without spending down all his money he needed to live. This guy watched his wife die, went home to almost poverty, and we brought him on hospice and died alone with the very minimal of services. He, you know, medic, he had just enough social security to pay for his water and his heat and those kind of things. On the other hand, this guy was surrounded by love, first of his wife, also by his family. He didn't have the basic necessities. He barely had security. And yet he would reach the higher levels of Maslow's pyramid, what I would call self-actualization, on every other measure. On the other hand, you know, I've taken care of people like I had this guy who I took care of who was a renowned businessman who owned a multi-billion dollar company who had enough money to buy the hospital wing he died in but was surrounded by family members who were more interested in his money than him and died a very lonely death, although he had those first levels of Maslow's pyramid completely covered. So I, I think sometimes... In my opinion, Maslow had it a little bit wrong, even though it's very straightforward to say, look, you know, I need food, I need shelter, I need clothing. I get all that. But you also can look at some of these third world countries where people have the most minimal of those things, live in a hut with five people, and still there's laughter and love and excitement. This idea that we need to wait to start thinking about those important things in life until we get our economics in hand I think it's better to start looking at them all together, even though it's not always easy. So that's one point about just about Maslow's Pyramid, because I think it's really interesting. Yeah. You asked, what would I do differently? So I think the hypothesis of my book and what I've come to learn, especially from dealing with the dying, is we wait too long to think about meaning and purpose and go for the lower hanging fruit of figuring out our finances first. So... I became a doctor because it fit my sense of identity when I was a kid and it bonded me to my father. But in a lot of ways, it never fit comfortably. Like, I didn't feel comfortable in medical school. I didn't have a lot of physician friends. I didn't like hanging out in the doctor's lounge. And the reason why is I had built an identity, a cloak around myself on the outside that didn't fit my insides. My insides were definitely more connected to writing and public speaking and blogging. What I consider myself now, if you ask, you know, what is your identity? I identify as a communicator, whereas up to when I went through all this, I would have identified mainly as a doctor. If I had spent more time thinking about meaning and purpose before I built my financial life, I probably could have done things in a different way and such that I would have never burned out of medicine. So I might not have gone into medicine, right? I could have gone into public speaking or journalism or something like that. But let's say that that wasn't my path. Let's say my path was still going into medicine. You know, at the end of my career in medicine, I found that when I subtracted all I didn't like about my job out because I had enough money and I didn't have to worry about it, the one thing that was left was my hospice work. Strangely enough, the first thing I did when I went to medical school in my first week is I volunteered to be a hospice volunteer. So I had started my career in hospice and then abandoned it to become a general internal medicine doctor and never turned back till later in my career. If I had done more thinking about meaning and purpose, maybe I still would have become a physician, but maybe I would have really embraced that hospice work way earlier on in my career and maybe then I wouldn't have burned out. I might not have even reached financial independence as fast, quote unquote, financial independence, but maybe I would have been doing something I loved 
that I would have done even if people weren't paying me for. So whatever money I made would have been enough to support my lifestyle. Maybe it would have been the slow road to financial independence, but I think I would have been living out my meaning and purpose more. So if I had been more thoughtful about meaning and purpose at the beginning of my journey and then built my finances around that, I think I would have made better choices. Yeah, and I think, you know, what happens for so many people is you lose sense of what it is that you actually like <laughs> or like what is your meaning like it, you have so much messaging it's something I'm exploring I'm in the process of writing my book now and so a lot of it is about the journey itself and um you know really figuring out what it is that you want like not what society tells you not your culture not media like what is it that you want and I think for a lot of people like you lose sight of that like what makes you happy so what are some things I mean would you recommend for people who are saying, well, I don't know, like, I don't actually know what my meaning is. And I think sometimes it's such a big question that people, you know, I don't even want to, some people don't want to think about the answer because it feels so big (laughs) and they may not be ready to answer the call, you know, what that is. So purpose and identity work is challenging. It's difficult. In the book, I actually go through an exercise called the life review. So this is something we do with hospice patients. When people find out they're dying, we, of course, we look at their symptoms, we try to make them comfortable. We make sure that they have everything set for them and their family, that they get appropriate care. But another thing we do is we sit down with the patient and talk to them about their life. And this can be done by a doctor, a chaplain, a social worker, a nurse, a volunteer. Basically, we ask questions like, what did you accomplish in life? What didn't you accomplish in life? What are those relationships that were important? What are your major failures? What are your major successes? What do you feel like you haven't accomplished yet? What could you accomplish over the next six months if you had the energy. This is a life review. And I think the beginning of purpose work at any age is for us to do our own little life review. And this is where dealing with the dying really has taught me about finances. Picture yourself at the doctor's office and the doctor has looked at you. And although you feel fine, they've said, you know what? I've looked at the numbers and unfortunately there's nothing we can do. You have six months to live. Now, obviously this would cause a lot of stress and anxiety, But at some point, you would look at your life and say, I wish I had had the strength or courage or energy to, and I say, dot, 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 what comes next? If you can do that visualization exercise at a young age and start thinking about what would you regret not doing or not at least trying if you were in your last months of life, it's a really great way to start thinking about purpose. And it doesn't come immediately, um, but it's a way of starting to prioritize what are those things that deep down inside are important to us that we let everything else get in the way of, right? I remember when I was in medical school and then started my own practice, I would sneak away at night when everyone was asleep to write blog posts about medicine. I would throw in public speaking engagements here and there when I could get a weekend off. I had all of these passions that I was trying to put into little time slots because somewhere in the back of my mind, I said, well, that's not really a career. Being a doctor is a job. That's what I can make money doing. Those other things, those are my hobbies, right? Or those are my quote unquote passions. It was only after I became financially independent that I allowed myself Mm -hmm. to spend more and more time doing those things. So the question is, What would you regret if you found out you were dying today not trying? I'm not saying succeeding, but not trying because they're very different. And what activities are you always trying to make a little bit of time here and there to do that you never give yourself the permission to take up a bigger part of your time? And I think if you can go through those two exercises, you can start to begin to build some semblance of what feels like purpose to you. And purpose can change. It doesn't have to be the same your whole life. I very much feel that my purpose as a young person was to become a doctor, but over time that changed and that's okay. Purpose can be something that you do for six months or 12 months, or it can be do something you do for the rest of your life. It can be something that's incredibly important to the world, right? You can save the whales or you can help underserved communities, you can volunteer your time, or it can be something completely selfish. Like it can be collecting action figures because that's what brings you joy, etc. None of that's important. What's important is what do you connect with and what would you regret if in the end you didn't have time or energy to do it? 
And I think once you've started looking at purpose, the next step is to really look at identity because I think identity and purpose are so, are so connected together. And an exercise I like to do with identity is to continuously ask yourself the question, I am, and fill in the blank. And usually when you start doing this, you'll say something like, I am a doctor. I certainly, that's how I would naturally answer it. Well, that's not really what I am. It's kind of what I do for a living. And then you kind of, you go further. I am, I am a father or a son or a husband, right? You start talking about relationships and those are important, but it's not exactly a hundred percent what you are. You might even go further. I am a Plutus award winner, right? You start thinking my awards, my accomplishments. Again, those things are cool, but they don't necessarily say what you are deep down inside. After asking myself that question many, many times over months and really thinking about it, I came up with I am a communicator. I am a writer, a podcaster, a public speaker. That's what I want to do for the rest of my life. That's how I want to spend my time. Um, I describe meaning and purpose. If, if you want to talk about what we actually do with that, I call it the climb, right? It's making progress to so towards something that has deep meaning for us. And so for me, the climb has to deal with communicating. It has to do with having great conversations. Um, and so the, I, I think it's a process of, of figuring out purpose and identity, but there's some exercises you can do to think deeply about, about what that means to you. And I also think it's important to figure out like this, this, the time allotment, like you talked about sometimes, you know, we're trying to fit our, our interest and the things that we really love into smaller time slots. And a lot of that is we feel obligated, you know, because we have to pay bills or because we have these things we need to do that most of our work is taking up our time. And so like, if, even if you're listening to this, and you're like, Oh yeah, there's some other things I'd want to do, but I don't feel like I'm in a position yet to like have that take over more like that the smaller parts to become bigger just yet. I think that's okay too. Like the awareness is key. Um, right. Because the, yeah, realistically, like if you're not financially, uh, at least stable, you can't just like flip things over and say, all right, I'm only going to work one hour and then I'll just do all the things I love, even if they don't bring in money for the majority of my day. Like most people are not going to be able to do that. So there is a transition or at least this part where the awareness is first. And I think too, like you can slowly start to plot out or plan out how you can make, you know, that reality come true. Right. And it's, it's a mistake to say that we shouldn't do things purely, for instance, for money. What I think the problem is, is is that we're not intentional about why we're doing it. So it is fine to say, I'm going to work nine to five at this job that I find mediocre for the next five years so that I can save up this many thousands of dollars so that I can then back off and spend more time doing this thing that's important to me that really is connected to meaning and purpose. Life is trade-offs. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do the work that's necessary to make the money we need. I guess what I'm saying is that we need to start more intentionally about why we're doing it and what the trade-offs are and continuously look at is that balance still correct as time goes on, right? So maybe now I'm doing 80% of my work during my normal work week for making money and it's mediocre. It's not great. It's not horrible, but I can manage. And then 20% is more purpose and meaning focused. But then as time goes on and you save money and it compounds and you're looking at your different net worth, et cetera, can you then start skewing in one direction or another? Maybe the economy's bad and you skew 90% work for money and 10% for more passion. Or maybe the economy's good and your net worth is starting to build and you say, mm, man, maybe now it's time to do 50-50. Or maybe it's time to find a job that better aligns with my meaning and purpose. So I'm doing 100% of my time working to making a decent amount of money. But now that also fulfills that sense of passion and purpose. Um, the point is to be intentional, not necessarily that we don't have to make sacrifices. Um, I think we all do. Yeah, yeah. And you can do like time audits, right? So like literally if you wanted to get down to how much percentage like the, that you're doing it, it's like, okay, you can track it. And just like we have goals like for our money, you could do the same thing with your time and energy of where you're currently putting it and where you want to be putting it. Yeah, and, and there's one other point that I think is really salient to this conversation is when you're making these decisions – I think you have to ask yourself a really important question, and that is, am I afraid that I'm going to die too soon and never enjoy my riches or wealth or whatever I've accumulated? Or am I afraid that I'm going to really live long and run out of money? And the reason why that question is important is it's going to change 
how you do to your day-to-day life. My father died when he was 40, and he had always thought he would die young. So he told my mother, he said, you know, we're going to get married, but I I warn you, I've always just felt I was going to die young. My dad had passions and hobbies. He turned down very a very lucrative job for one that was less lucrative but was more passionate about. Of course, he got life insurance and made sure his family was okay, but I don't think he spent a lot of time worrying about saving for retirement, which was totally appropriate for him. Hmm. On the other hand, I always figured I'd live long, so I didn't mind grinding it out for 10, 20 years thinking, I'll make a lot of money, I'll let it compound, and then I'll have the rest of my life to enjoy myself while that money is building and growing. The reason why this question is so important is it'll really help you toggle how aggressive you are today about your finances. So I think we should all work towards financial independence, and there's some really good ways to do that. But if you think you're going to die young, spend your money, you know, YOLO it a little bit, really enjoy yourself. Maybe you only save 10% or 5% instead of saving 50%. But then you're living a great life. And if you happen to die young, then you lived it up. And if you don't happen to die young, you're still building financial independence over a longer period of time, but you're really enjoying yourself. Um, On the other hand, if you think you have all the time in the world, don't worry about loving every minute right now. Go out and make money and get it into investments and let it compound If you're going to live long, heck, you know, you can do like me, which is slow down in your mid 40s and hopefully, fingers crossed, have another 40 years to live it up. Yeah. And and that's the thing. Like, I think people are just so afraid of getting it wrong or they just don't know. Like, I have never thought I've not sit down and thought of, you know, when I think I'm going, you know, to, to die. I've I've always just, you know, felt like I just don't know. And I've always erred on the side of being more uh, conservative, meaning I do think that, you know, I, I'd rather not run out of money. But I've come to a point where, you know, I'm just like, I do want to, like, enjoy my life. Like, at what point am I going to be, like, the grown Jamila? Like, instead of, like, you know how, like, when you get older, when I get older, I'm going to take this trip and I'm going to have this, like, life. And I'm like, okay, girl, like, you're about to, you, you're, you're getting to that halfway mark of, like, if I live to 80, like, I'm almost 40. <laughs> I can't believe I'm, like, almost 40. Like, and so... For me, it feels like, well, I don't know. I made it this far, thank God. But you ne- you never do know. And I think that's where a lot of people get stuck because I do have some uh, friends and family, and they are not thinking about, like, the 70, 80-year-old. Like, they're like, I'm going to worry about that later. I'm just trying to live today. And then there, I know a lot of people within, like, the space who are so aggressive with, like, saving and investing, and, like, they're not enjoying – well, from the outside looking in, it doesn't seem like they're enjoying their, their money. So – I think the part is people don't know. And so they just kind of like go either way sometimes. I think we don't understand the shades of gray, right? So Mm -hmm. on one side, you have complete YOLO where you spend money the minute you get it to have as many awesome experiences and enjoy as much as possible. On the other hand, we have total deferred graduate gratification, deferred gratification where you pretty much put everything away. You don't enjoy anything. You live as frugally as possible. Life isn't like that. Like, The truth of the matter is there's lots of shades of gray. And so I don't think we're ever going to get it perfect. Like Bill Perkins book, Die With Zero, you're probably not going to die with zero. Because if you do make sure you die with zero, you may have zero too early and then have problems later on. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get exactly there. You're never going to figure out the difference, you know, that between YOLO and deferred gratification perfectly. The question is not to get anchored on one side of the scale, but again, to be intentional about toggling back and forth so that you enjoy today as well as the possibility of enjoying tomorrow. Yeah, and I think the key here is knowing thyself. Like, if you know that you err to one side more than the other, like I know um, of someone where, it's like, they literally were not able, like, they, did, they didn't have any money in their bank account. Like, and so they, they couldn't do this thing. Like, they were looking forward to taking a trip. And they got their tax refund. And they used that whole refund, like, on the trip. And they, like, went all out. Like, it wasn't like I'm budgeting when I'm at this restaurant. They were like, yesterday I could not go on this trip. Today I got all this money in. I'm going to live my life. And so that person, and from my outside opinion, would I would say, like, they err more on the side of, listen, I don't know the next time I'm going to get it. I'm going to enjoy my life today, you know, versus, like, my personality is more like, whoa, that was a close one because I almost did not have this money. So I'm going to like maybe spend a little bit or save half of it. And so, but airing on or at least knowing kind of who you are and what you tend to like go towards and doesn't make it wrong. Like, you know, I would do things a little bit differently if I were her, but 
it's still where it's just like at least the first is awareness. And if you always find yourself in kind of like that have and have not situation, it's kind of like, okay, how can we prevent that so that you do have a little bit more next time and you're not all or nothing? When what I love about the awareness is if you can become aware, then you can create hacks to work around it. So for the person who spends every single penny, if they have automated savings that goes right into an investing account and they don't even see the money, that hack can pretty much take care of it. So if they can decide beforehand what's reasonable to save, they never have to think about it again. People like you and I might be exactly the opposite. We need to have money that automatically goes into a YOLO fund that we are required to spend by the end of the year. And that hack pretty much, I know if the money that automatically goes into that account, if there's money there, I don't have to question. I can spend it on whatever the heck I want, however I want. And so the idea, again, is if you can be aware of it, you can create those hacks to make sure that, again, you don't fall too far on one side or the other. You know, that's such a good point, Jordan, because I so I have um, a well, we have kind of just like a whatever fund, like, you know, a lot of that we can spend. But I've always still looked at it as like almost like a sinking fund in a way. So like we don't always spend it at the end of the month. So if I like let's just say I'm putting away two hundred dollars in my spend whatever, you know, um, category, I don't always spend that money every month. But I do like the idea of um, for the people who are really like you have a problem spending money, even though you can, it's like you you need to spend that money. And I don't know, like, I don't want to make it where it's like you have to spend it on yourself, because part of that could be, well, I'm gonna like maybe uh, spend it on someone else or do something yeah. else. And because it, it doesn't have to be like, this waste where you know, I'm, we're not saying like to go out and just like spend it on something you don't care about. But it, it I do like the idea of maybe a portion of that money. It's like you need to spend it like you need to spend it on whatever you want. OK, it could be. But I like kind of that because sometimes people still have this like, you know, uh, YOLO part of their budget that they're not spending because it's still that like, well, maybe something else is going to come up. Yeah. I mean, it gets back to this whole idea of money as a goal versus a tool. We forget money as a tool. So if you don't use it, then you're not really using that tool. It's just sitting in the tool shed yeah. doing nothing. Um, right? So we don't want to prematurely use it when we're going to need it later. But on the other hand, we also don't want it to be hidden away until we're having a terminal illness and, and can't have the energy or ability to use it. And so that's, you know, it, it comes back to those same ideas of how to effectively use money for what it was meant to be used for. Hmm. All right, let's 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 talk a little bit about the parable of the three brothers and how it relates to career and financial independence. So the parable of the three brothers is my financial framework for the way that people reach financial independence. We often talk about financial independence as if it's this one thing. And my theory is it's many things, but the easiest way is to describe what I think are the kind of three major patterns. So in the book, I talk about the parable of the three brothers. The eldest brother is the one who is on this long path and they don't love the path. All they can think about is what's going to be there at the end. And so they rush all the way to the end as quick as possible, exhaust themselves, uh, but then get there way earlier than either of the other brothers. They have all this freedom. They're a little bit burned out. They're a little bit tired, but they got there first. The middle brother feels a lot like the eldest brother. They don't particularly love their path, but they don't have the stamina. So the middle brother tries to start out like a freight train, just like the eldest brother, but gets tired and has to go take a flight of fancy out into the fields or in the woods, has to take a mini vacation something to give them a break, and then they can come back refreshed. They get to their end of their path a little bit after the eldest brother, not quite as fast. Maybe they have less time now to enjoy their freedom, but they're probably not as exhausted. And then last but not least, the most peculiar of them all is the youngest brother who loves the path. So the youngest brother takes their time, enjoys the sights, is in no particular rush, gets to the end of the path way after either of the other brothers, and then does something that neither of the other brothers can understand. The youngest brother gets to the end, turns around, and starts walking back the way he came from. So what does this parable mean? To me, these are the three classic views of financial independence, or at least how I define it. The eldest brother is like those early financial independence, retire early practitioners. These are the 
people who had high paying jobs, some of them tech, some of them professional, didn't necessarily love their job at some point realized that they didn't want to exist under the hegemony of employeeship and made as much money as fast as possible, invested it and got out, right? So that's kind of one path. That's what I call front loading the sacrifice. That's certainly what I did in a lot of ways. And the good thing about that, especially if you live a nice long life, is you accumulate enough money to really spend maybe the second half of your life really working on meaning and purpose. The middle brother doesn't really have the stamina to grind it out the way the eldest brother does. They get kind of exhausted, don't feel like they can do it all at once. This is really kind of that side hustle, passive income, mini retirement view. So these are people who need to find a little more meaning and purpose in their job at the moment. They don't like working for other people. They do side jobs. They find ways to own real estate and things that pay them passively. Um, not quite as fast often as the elder brother, but when they can make enough money each month through passive income or side hustles that it covers their monthly needs, they're pretty much at financial independence. And then last but not least, you have the rarest of all the youngest brothers are people who love their jobs. They're passionate about what they do. These people, in my opinion, are financially independent the moment they find a job that fulfills their sense of meaning and purpose that also pays the monthly bills, right? So you could be 22 and be an artist and love painting and get a dream job, and you're pretty much financially independent if that gives you enough to take care of you and yours. Now, of course, youngest brothers do run into the fact that if they get disabled or stop loving their passion, they have to plan for those kind of things too. Uh, but these are kind of the three paradigms of different ways to reach financial independence. As I was saying before, I think a big mistake we make is we concentrate on which brother we want to be sometimes before we start thinking about our meaning and purpose. If we start meaning, thinking about our meaning and purpose first, we can then intentionally decide which brother we want to be. And we may change from time to time. For instance, I would have told you when my father died that I was like the youngest brother because I was passionate about becoming a doctor. But then in the middle of my career, I became burned out and really became a lot like the eldest brother who just wanted to make a lot of money, get it invested, and get out as soon as possible. So I started doing side hustles. One of my side hustles was actually consulting with a hospice company. I had never done that before. By the end of my career, I started feeling like the youngest brother because I was passionate about hospice work and would do it even if I wasn't being paid for it. So I'm not saying you have to be one type of brother your whole life, but I do think we have to be thoughtful about how we build this financial independence structure so that it can serve us. Mm, I love I love that on um, Parable. And yeah, it makes so much sense. Like you can start out. And I do think, you know, for some people uh, who have uh, I you know like when my back was more against the wall when I wanted to quit my job I, I was more aggressive with saving and investing like I was like you know the oldest brother like it was really important to save and invest as much as possible and then as I, then as I actually was able to quit and do what I'm doing now I definitely feel like I'm more like middle m middle brother in a way like I'm still working towards the technical term of financial independence but I, I think it's important that, like you said, people, you can change. Like, it doesn't have to be one or the other. I mean, there is a benefit in a way to, if you can, upload, like, spend, like, a couple years being aggressive, like, to get to a stable place, right? To get out of the debt stage, to, you know, have some stability um, and to get out, to get there quickly. So that way, like, you have more time on the back end, but you don't need to run that whole sprint for the whole marathon. Like, I do think it's in sprints that you can do it. Um, but I think the overall goal is, like, to be, like, brother one or brother one, the youngest brother who is enjoying their career, um, taking things slow. It was like, I can work forever, but has the ability to earn money or at least do it in a way that feels so good like brother three. Well, brother three is not necessarily like feeling good, but it sounds like brother three is like saving. His savings rate is higher. So I think like the, the, the overall goal would be to do something you love and get paid for it well enough to what's your level of being paid well that you can still like live your life and save and invest for like the rainy day that you decide you want to take a break. Yeah. And, and again, I think when you put in the context, I always bring it back to time, right? That time is open and it's set. So what activities are you going to fill that time with? Building this financial framework just is a better use of figuring out how am I going to fill that time 
in an attempt to be financially stable as well as do things I like to do. And so I think it all comes back to that is, is giving you multiple options of what activities to place in that time slot, uh, making those the activities that really feel the best to you and fulfill your needs. Mm. And you know, the thing I used to like money, we know it's like in a way, um, you know, you can replenish it for the most part, but like time is something you can't get back. But you know, this, you know, cause you see it up close, but energy is also important because you can also, you know, there's people who are retired and I, I put energy in the realm of also health, but like the, even just the want to do things. And I really got this from, or I, I, I know Bill Perkins talks about this a lot in his book. Like, you know, you can have an interest in your twenties or thirties. And then you literally, like, as you get older, you think you're going to put the, let's put that off until I'm interested in doing it and I have the time, but you don't even have the energy or want to do it. Like there are things that I wanted to do in my twenties. And I said, when I'm older, I do, I'll do it. And I'm like, I'm not even interested anymore, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it just shows you that like, if you're in a moment of your life where you're interested in something and you do have a passion about something, sometimes putting it off and saying, I'll do it later. Like you may not want to do it later. So, you know, strike when the iron is hot, like <laughs> if you can and, and, and do those things today. Yeah, most definitely. And I, I, I think as I've traveled this journey myself, I'm definitely way more open to experiencing today than I was at the beginning. At the beginning, I was all about budgeting and saving and, and having extra, every extra cent around. It's only f my personal growth where I've gone back and said, well, maybe that path to getting that net worth I wanted or calling myself financially independent could have been put off for a little bit of time to spend that moment doing something that I thought was important. And certainly dealing with the dying, I've seen multiple cases of, of people who had taken the time and spent the money, um, like a patient of mine who had taken a year off to climb Mount Everest, in which he didn't succeed. But when he ended up dying in his mid-40s, he was so thankful that he didn't put it off and did it. So I know lots of people like that. And then I also have lots of examples of people who died and regret that they never had spent the time doing that thing that was utterly important to them. And so I think it goes both ways. But certainly as I grow myself, I start thinking more about worrying less about delaying the money piece and worrying more about living today in an appropriate way. Mm -hmm. And you just said something else too, like the personal development, like once you start working on yourself more, it's the inner work that you're talking about that I'm talking about that, like that actually is, it's what allows you to realize, to self realize and actualize the life you want. Because without understanding who we are, what makes us happy, without like really expanding like our mind and, you know, whatever, if you have, if you have faith, like leaning more into that too, like it's going to just feel like, you know, it's never ending. Like, you know, like it can feel just like you're on like a treadmill, like Groundhog's Day, like every day, like, you know, you're just working and you're paying bills and, but there ha it's more to life than that. Yeah, I, I definitely, and so, you know, it's funny, it's hard for me not to celebrate the eldest brother, and the reason why is, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I couldn't imagine living the life I'm living today, in which almost all my time was spent doing things I deeply wanted to do. Um, that doesn't mean that the path of the eldest brother is right, but certainly it served me for the time I did it. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing, right? So you're saying that you got to you're where you are now because you adopted the eldest brother's path of kind of going hard and fast, you know, for a time. And now you're able to like, look, you're enjoying your life now. You're doing all the things you love. And now you have the money to do it because you front loaded it. And then it's like almost just like it's again, the people who say, oh, you know, not not, not that you shouldn't worry about money, but like, you know, wealthy people or people who already have it will say, you know, it's not all about that, like, take your time, you know, slow down, it's not the money. But it's like, from your perspective, you can say that and I can kind of say it in a way, I'm not as financially probably independent or secure as you are. Uh, but it just feels like, again, I, I also appreciate the oldest brother, because I wouldn't have if I would have taken the approach of following my passion, and I did not get like my full time job right out of college, like that job even though it wasn't something I loved, like it allowed me to do and be where I am today versus like I have some friends and people who are, they fo they're following their passion. 
but they're also a little bit less financially secure. They don't have as much money. And so they can't do they, like we're now we're the same age and they they're 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 not able to do some of the things they want financially because they're still kind of figuring things out. So it's almost just like I don't think either one is wrong, right? Like I think and there's there's pros and cons to all three, I guess, you know, like or risk that you're going to take on. But um, it's really just understanding that you can also change. Like if you find yourself that you're the youngest or the oldest and you're not enjoying it, you can take another approach. <laughs> Yeah. And let me, um, you know, so the counter argument is, I think in each of us, the answer will be different. But for instance, I talk in the book about Jessica Lynn, who coined the term slow fi, right? So she's someone who's been very much about lifestyle design and has specifically slowed her financial goals so that she could do things she wanted to do today. And it's worked out very well for her in a lot of ways, she really fits that profile of a middle brother or Cody Berman from the Fi show. He's another great, you know, did real estate and side hustles and passive income. Yeah. And he's another, also another great example of, of kind of a middle brother. And then I start thinking about some people who I know are a lot like youngest brothers. One comes to mind just off the top of my head is someone like Scott Trench, right? Scott Trench, who loves his job. He works at Bigger Pockets. Um, probably has gotten to financial independence or very, very close to it. On the other hand, I don't know if he would stop doing what he does because I think he has that innate drive to do it. Um, so I think there's some of us, and I will say that kind of the OG fire movement, and when I say OG, I'm really talking about the people who kind of got into it in the you know 2008 to 2015 years were a lot more like the eldest brothers I think what we're seeing is the evolution is way more towards the middle and youngest brothers in a lot of ways, especially the middle brother with slow fi and coast fi and barista fi and all these new terms that pretty much say, hey, we want to be financially independent, but we also want to live today. Yeah. And I think because it's also more mainstream and all, it's becoming just as because also, not that it's not mainstream, I think this concept and idea is something that we everyone wants. Like, not necessarily to retire early, but to have autonomy, to have freedom and options. And so I just also feel like if it were to stay and the only messaging were to be like the old old school, F, you know, Mr. Mister Money Mustache, um, and people that I was like started to pay attention to when I first came into the space, like that's not appealing to the masses, like for most people. Um, and I think what's happening is there's like this middle ground between like the fire movement and just like regular personal finance where like yep. the average person doesn't want to do what, you know, to only maybe spend on purpose 15,000 a year. Like they want to have like take luxury vacations or have a nice car, but also be able to quit their job if their boss annoys them, you know, or if it's a bad situation. So there's that middle ground that that's why I think this is more what more people in the space are coming up with, I think, cool concepts and names to help help people feel more connected to this idea of the slower, more intentional life that you can live on your way to financial independence. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I, I think it's um, in many ways, I think it's a little bit more of a mature way to look at it. Um, and, and again, I'm very thankful for the path I took. But I think stress levels, anxiety levels, et cetera, I definitely see, especially some of the young people, what they're doing today. And I say, aha, you know, they've learned kind of from what we've all gone through and taken it to that next level. Yes. Okay, Jordan, please tell everyone more about your book, where they can find it and where they can follow and find more about you. So the book is Taking Stock, a Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life will be available through Ulysses Press August 2nd, pretty much anywhere you buy books, certainly online at Amazon and Books A Million and Barnes and Nobles and Target and all of those places. The best way to learn about the book or what I am up to is probably to go to my branded website that is jordangrummet.com. J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T dot com. The reason why that's the best place is you can learn about all things book as well as you can connect to my medical blog, my financial blog, as well as the Earn and Invest podcast, Earn and Invest podcast, earninvest.com. It's where I probably create the most content today outside of the book. Those are the easiest ways to reach me and you can find all my socials at those places too. And I will also make sure to link that in the episode show notes. Thank you so much again, Jordan, for this wonderful conversation. It has been a pleasure. Thank you for having me on.